be reading chapter 11, uh, verses 16 through 19, but then we're going to be reading 25 to 30 as well. So, uh, Here we go. This is the word of God. To what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. You sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Here's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her actions. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Here in reading God's holy word, may add a blessing to all that have ears to hear. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for this day. And the, the days of summer where things are a little more relaxed and, and enjoying life. Lord, help us to learn a little bit about sharing our burden with you this day. And help us to be wise. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Chapter 11 of Matthew's uh, Gospel uh, begins with the disciples of John the Baptist, who has been placed in, in prison by King Herod and is now on death row, if you would. And these disciples come asking Jesus if he is the one that they have been expecting or should they look for another. John, who so clearly recognized Jesus the day of the baptizing in the Jordan River, now is having some doubts. But who can really, who can blame him? He came out of the wilderness to proclaim, repent for the kingdom of God is near. His message was to straighten up their acts because the one that was more powerful than he, the one that he was not even worthy of untying his sandals, the one that would come and separate the wheat from the chaff was coming. And he was close at hand. The judgment that John had envisioned was not coming forthright. The corrupt were still in power, and he finds himself in anguish in Herod's jail cell. Jesus' response to John's disciples was this. Go, tell John what you have seen. Seen happening here. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf are hearing. The poor are receiving good news. Now these aren't mighty acts of judgment. 
But surely they are indicators of the heaven of God coming near. And after this, John's disciples leave, Jesus returns to the crowds and, and begins to, to speak of John. He gives high praise to the one who has preceded his coming, saying that none that have lived have ever been as great as John. He says that John is the fulfillment of prophecy, the Eliza chosen by God to prepare the way for the Messiah. And John stood at the very edge of the kingdom. Yet now the kingdom is breaking into the world through Jesus, and now even the least of these in the kingdom is greater than John. That's chapter 11, verse 11. And it's in this context that we begin our scripture for this morning. When I look at scripture, I try to find similarities or repeating words or reading, repeating ideas or, or threads that, that move through the through the scripture to, to help with the message. And, and Matthew uses uh, the words children in, in chapter 11, 16. Wisdom right in her actions, that's verse 19. Wise and learned and revealed them to little children, verse 25. Weary and burdened, 28. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, verse 29. And so as I, I looked at those words and I, and, I, and I prayed over them, it came to me that maybe Jesus is acting, uh, asking us to be wise. W-I-S-E. Since Jesus speaks of wisdom and, and wise, it was a natural fit for me to, to, for my mind to drift to this acronym, which helped me to come to a better understanding of, of what Jesus might be trying to, to, to tell us. So let's take a look at what we found. W. Wavering. Jesus begins his teaching by saying the generation is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to others. Say, hey, over there, this is a wedding feast, let's dance. But on the other side, they say, no, this is a funeral, let's mourn. Jesus continues to say, you thought John was weird and processed a, a, a demon. And you didn't listen to him, but, but now you say, I'm a, I'm a drunkard because I eat and drink and with sinners, and you don't listen to me either. Remember being on the playground as children? Oftentimes we go out on the playground, you know, and uh, we try to decide what we're going to play, you know. They, they're usually two or three would, or more would come up with an, you know, an idea to play. And, and, you know, they would, no, let's do this, no, let's do this, no, let's do this, no, let's do this. And by the time we decided, it was time to go back in. That's what G Matthew is saying as he says, we played a feast and you did not dance. Sometimes there is a voice of reason in all that, isn't there? But what happens to that voice, often ignored? No wavering from the truth is what Jesus says. And what does, what does he mean by this? The people didn't like what John was saying, so they chose not to listen to him, choosing to waver from hearing the word of God, but yet finding fault with the man. Get that? The people didn't like what Jesus was saying either or doing or the words that he was teaching. They chose to waver from the truth of Jesus and, and find fault with the man. Those words not only are appropriate for the words for the, that generation, Matthew's generation, but it fits pretty well for today too, doesn't it? And it fits every generation that has come since. 
how blatantly we are shown the truth of, of, of this in, in the political arena for today. You know, people are bouncing back and forth, trying to please the folks that, that have elected them and so that they get reelected. Worse yet, people don't agree with a, with a certain position or platform and they begin attacking the person rather than trying to come up with a solution to benefit everyone. We don't like what we hear, so we attack the person. And the church has not been immune to this phenomenon either, has it? It's been a long-standing history of disputes over doctrine in churches, polity, and many other minor details that has to do with more with promotion of human ideas rather than the kingdom of God. Pastor Ken Sauer tells a story of speaking with a member of his church that had moved uh, his membership, her membership, to a, another church in the area. And so he took the opportunity to go visit this, this woman to, to see what it was that she'd been a member of this church for a long time and she, he wanted to know why she was leaving. And so he went to visit her. He was really interested in improving what was going on in his church. So he went to the house and he knocked on the door and the woman let him in. And, and he asked her, why are, you, why are you leaving? Why are you transferring your membership to another church? And she said, well, I really don't like this uh, evangel evangelical outreach things that we've been doing here in church. We've been doing them for years and years and it doesn't seem to be making any difference. We should be sending our money overseas. And the pastor says, okay. We can understand that, but over the years there have been several people come to the life of the church through those outreach programs and and while it's, it is important to send money overseas, truly the best missionary place is in our backyard. This seemed to make sense to the woman and, and she didn't have a response. So she changed up her, changed up her answer a little bit. She says, well, I, I don't like being asked for money all the time. And the pastor made his response and Again, she changed her, her, her answer, and, and, and finally, finally, she says, I don't know why I'm leaving. I'm just leaving, and it has nothing to do with you. Church hopping and church shopping has become commonplace. We might not like hear, we might not like a pastor, we might not like hearing what, what is being said. Uh, maybe it's a little too pointing for us. Maybe we don't like something that has went down. Maybe there's been something that we've been a part of for a long time and they want to change that. Well, I'm not going to change it, I'm leaving kind of mentality. But Jesus says, but wisdom is proven right by her actions. Jesus says that his own deeds, healing, teaching, preaching, they all give evidence that he embodies the wisdom of God, that he is indeed the one to come, the one who ushers in the kingdom of God. He says, have no doubt, do not waver, I am the real deal. I am. Illumine. John 1, 4-5 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but darkness has not understood it. In our scripture this morning, Jesus prays, giving praise to the Father for the wisdom shown. That wisdom being that the light was seen by the little children and not the learned and wise. Evening falls, and the shadows begin to creep up the walls of our living room. And instinctively, what do we do? We get up and turn on the lights. We go over, flip the switch, 
and the light comes on. We choose to not remain in darkness. Darkness is not a comfortable place for me, especially driving at night. I feel like I just can't see enough. There's something out there that, that I have to be wary of. I'm just not comfortable being in the darkness. And so we choose to turn on the light. The world around us is darkness. And Jesus is the light that will illuminate it if we'll only ask. If we'll only flip the switch, if you will. The learned and the wise, they already knew everything or they thought they did. The wise and alert, learned didn't want the world around them to be illuminated. For if it was, their acts and deeds would be shown to others. Their behaviors would be revealed. Jesus came to be the light to those who would accept it. To the children, the simple-hearted, the ones who would accept and claim Jesus as the one true Messiah. S. Soul. Verse 28, Jesus changes his thought process a little bit here. He has told us we shouldn't waver. He has told us that, that he has come to be the light to be revealed to the world, to the less than folks. He now provides an invitation. He says he's worried about our souls. He begins his invitation by saying, come to me. This tells me that there, there are no strings attached here. Jesus doesn't say, if you do this, or if you do that, or if you do something in a certain way, then come to me. He simply says, come. He says, come to me. All you are, who are weary and burdened. That short sentence is probably one of the best known verses in the Bible. How many of you recognize that verse? Sure, why? Because how many of us here today are not carrying a burden of one thing or another? Or how many of us, if we're, not, if we're feeling pretty good and, and life is good right now, but how many of us have been in a situation where we have burdened, been burdened and heavy laden? So the scripture offers hope. We are a heavy and laden and burdened society today, aren't we? We have more, but we're less satisfied. We have more technology, but less time. We burden ourselves with so much stuff that, that how can we not be weary? And Jesus is pointing to those burdens that the Pharisees and leaders have put upon the common people. Heavy taxes, hard work, high expectations of fulfillment of the law. The words might be different. But the message is the same. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Rest for your soul. Not rest for the body. A deeper rest. A rest where you don't have to worry about tomorrow. A rest where we need not be concerned about death. A rest that gives us hope in those times of greatest need. E. Easy. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Jesus is not talking about the inside of an egg here, folks. <laughs> A yoke. 
a yoke, a wooden beam fashioned to team two oxen together, a wooden beam fashioned to fit a person's shoulders just right to less, lessen the burden of carrying a heavy load. Jesus says, easy doesn't mean having an easy button. But Jesus says, take my yoke. Put my yoke on your shoulders because it's made just for you. And it's going to fit you perfectly. He says, with that, I will lessen your load. Put on my yoke and learn be my teammate, Jesus says. Be the other side of the yoke that ties us together. Let me teach you how to carry that burden with less effort so that you may teach others. For he says, I am gentle and humble of heart. Under the taskmaster's whip, or the daily drudge of our lives. Those words are soothing balm, aren't they? For I am gentle, and I will help you carry the Lord. In an age of turmoil that we are living in today, how much more do we need to hear those words? We need to hear, come to me, all that are heavy laden and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, for my yoke is easy and light, and I will help you carry that load. There was a young dog out in the yard, and he was uh, doing what dogs do best. Until I told Jared that you know, this this story kind of remembered of it, reminded me of their dog Chevy. He's just a little, but he was out in the yard and he was chasing his tail around. He was spinning around, he was spinning around, 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 and as this. Young dog was spinning around and around and around and around and around. An older dog comes sauntering up to the, to the young dog. And he says, um, hey, what are you doing? Well, the young dog stopped for a minute. He says, well, I'm chasing my tail. You see, tail, my, in my tail is happiness. When, when my tail wags, I'm happy. When it's down, I'm sad. And with that, he went spinning around, 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 around. Finally, the old dog, the young dog, he just fell down in exhaustion. He just couldn't chase his tail anymore. He was done because it was elusive. Just could never quite get a hold of it. And when he did that, the old dog said to him, you know, I found that if I just bide my time and, and go forward, <laughs> happiness follows me wherever I go. <laughs> we get busy chasing our tails, don't we? For all that, that elusive happiness. And in doing so, we pick up a lot of burden along the way, don't we? Because if we're doing all this if we're chasing our tail, if we're picking things up and moving along, it gets pretty heavy. Help. And Jesus says, let me help you. Let me help you carry your burden. And happiness will follow. Because there's joy. Joy comes in the morning. So I challenge us this week to be wise. W-I-S-E. I challenge us to, to not waver from the truth that Jesus is the one true Messiah. That we allow Jesus to illuminate us, 
to reveal himself to us so we can illuminate the world for Jesus needs to be in the world. The world needs Jesus to be there. And let us remember that, that Jesus is worried about our soul. And he wants to give us rest for that soul. And help us to remember that Jesus' yoke is easy. And he helps us carry the burden. But first we have to take the yoke upon us. So let's be wise as we go forth in our journey with Christ. Amen. Folks, we need to keep in, in prayer. We need to continue to keep Phyllis in prayer uh, as uh, she's trying to, to get better to come home. There